This week on Quadriga, Morning Mandela, End of the Rainbow. The world has been saying farewell to a legendary figure. Nelson Mandela was a role model for millions. Dignitaries flock to South Africa from all over the globe to pay their final respects to the man who personified the struggle for freedom from racism and oppression. The feelings and ideas he inspired changed Africa fundamentally. His death has shaken the continent. Will Nelson Mandela's vision of a rainbow democracy live on? Your host this week, Melinda Crane. Hello and welcome to Quadriga. Well, that's the question we want to pose today. Does Mandela's death signify the end of the rainbow? And we're going to discuss that with three people who follow events in Africa very closely. Francisco Um Dusterhoff works with Amnesty International's German office as an Africa expert. She's a specialist on human rights in Africa and she joined Amnesty five years ago. Warm welcome to you. Richard Hamis is a journalist with Germany's radio and TV network, MDR. As a senior program editor, he participated in setting up the Mariah UN radio station in his home country, South Sudan. And Nlanla Sibisi grew up in South Africa under the apartheid system and was recruited as an underground operative of the ANC when he was just 18. After South Africa's transition to democracy, he began working in the field of sustainable development, and he's currently working on a PhD at Berlin's Free University. Mr. Sabisi, you spent your formative years uh, under the influence of the ANC. You met Mandela shortly after he was released from prison. What's this week been like for you? What's been going through your, your mind? Well, I guess uh, just as many South Africans back home, it's uh, very emotional. And um, having met him, as you rightfully said, in uh, 1990, just a couple of months after he had actually um, uh, been released, um, and our, I had uh, th the very opportune privilege of even being able to shake his hand. Um, uh, I was, it was a small group of uh, MK soldiers, as the ANC military wing was known at that time, and I, and I was one of the flag bearers. So um, uh, after he had given us a uh, briefing, uh, we were very fortunate as that small group of flag bearers to have the opportunity to shake his hand. So um, that moment still lingers with me, and I'm sure you can even hear the emotion, it still exists. And um, I, 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 I really mourn his loss as much as every South African back home. Richard Hamis, we've heard many people both in South Africa and outside, including even Barack Obama, saying that they wouldn't be where they are today if it weren't for Nelson Mandela. Do you think many people in other parts of Africa could also make a similar claim? Uh, well, um, <laughs> unfortunately, I, I, you know, I, I, I won't agree on that. Um, you know, you cannot compare, actually you can compare nobody to Nelson Mandela. He's been an iconic of uh, African people, not only that, but the world over. Um, he's, a very, he's been a very charismatic person. He's a, uh, been a, a person who can move people with um, humanitarian ideas, ideas that we actually need today. Um, unfortunately, um, not many African leaders have learned uh, from him. And uh, well, I guess they should do their homework. But in terms of how, say, an average African citizen might see him, would you say that he changed people's ideas of themselves, that he served as an inspiration for Africans in general? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, um, according to my, experience, my personal experience in Africa, back home in Africa, uh, I've talked to a lot of common people who see him as the way forward actually for the continent, for the whole continent. Francisco, um, uh, one of the unique achievements that we've been recalling again and again this past week is forgiveness. Nelson Mandela presided over what was called a truth and reconciliation process that in fact has become something of a model for many other countries in dealing with human rights abuses. Isn't that right? Yeah, that's right indeed. Uh, I think one of the most remarkable um, things about Nelson Mandela is that he was able to um, find the strength to uh, start this 
path of forgiveness and healing and reconciliation. And one of those um, things was to create um, those commissions of reconciliation, meaning that perpetrators and victims of human rights violations during the apartheid come together and talk about those violations. And um, that he understood that um, this would be the condition for a future peaceful uh, living together of um, South African society. And indeed, this was a model for other African countries and was taken up by a lot of other African countries um, coming out of conflict or civil wars, for example, um, in Liberia, um, but also in Kenya after the electoral violences in 2007 and 2008. And the latest, latest example is uh, Mali, who, which uh, announced um, that they would also take up such a reconciliation process. And Nanda Sibisi, at the time that Nelson Mandela was arguing for such a process of reconciliation, of forgiveness, were there people in the ANC, you were in the military wing after all, saying, what are you talking about? These were our enemies. How can we, how can we forgive them? Was there, was there a lack of understanding for that at the time? At the beginning, I would say definitely there was, there was a lack of uh, misunderstanding. Uh, it was also, um, it had a lot of mistrust in it. And I guess it took uh, leaders like Mandela to actually convince the rank and file, so, I mean, so to say that uh, it's a process that's necessary. Uh, it, we cannot afford to actually be going back um, uh, and fighting. So, but I must say that process, uh, for some, it did bring some closure, but for some, we, uh, we still feel that, you know, uh, it could have been done in a much better way. Because um, uh, one thing that's very clear that the, the decision makers uh, uh, um, uh, were actually not really brought to book. Uh, your, your ordinary rank and file within the apartheid apparatus, uh, the in, I mean, from the security system, they are the people who actually pay the price. And uh, some of them went to prison, uh, some of them uh, who spoke, they got uh, um, uh, uh, the so-called amnesty. But um, the really big fish within the, uh, the apartheid apparatus are still living, I mean, at la I mean no, not really at large, but they're living a very free and enjoyable life. And, a lot of people feel that some of them should have been brought to work. Please. Yeah, um, this is one thing that Amnesty criticized actually, that um, during those commissions um, the um, prosecution means were missing. So yeah. it was just talking, getting together and then getting over it basically to, together, but there were no prosecution. This was different in Liberia for example, and there it was combined. But um, let me add one thing, what um, Mandela um, fought for was also to include the ANC in the process because there have been uh, human rights violations as well and um, he also fought to, for including them. Richard Khamis, yes. um, certainly in this past week we've heard many, many stories about South African exceptionalism, uh, uh, one might say. Nelson Mandela himself, of course, being the leading example of that very, very exceptional uh, approach, truth and reconciliation among it. Then South Africa, of course, hosting a triumphant uh, World Cup in 2010, South Africa as an economic powerhouse. To what degree does the rest of the continent see South Africa as a beacon, uh, as, as an exceptional country? Uh, well, um, the rest of the continent knows uh, that uh, South Africa is a superpower, as you mentioned, and they know that they can learn from South Africa. They can learn from the maturity of South African leadership. and. Um, uh, I'll, I'll give you a very good example. The conflict in Sudan uh, between the South and the North came to an end in 2005, but uh, not every part of the conflict has been you know, solved. So what uh, the two warring parties did was to ask for Thabo Mbeki, a person who has been with Mandela for a very, very long time, to help them in the, you know, the, in the process of getting, you know, um, a solution to the conflicts that we have in Sudan. And um, so that means that the warring parties or these two parties in, in Sudan have seen 
um, what they can learn from South Africa, and especially the legend of Man Mandela, in terms of peace building, in terms of reconciliation. And um, it's been working out very, very well. And um, I guess Rwanda also learned a lot from Mandela after the genocide. Um, they actually created these courts there, um, not to persecute people, but at least you know to sit down and talk and realize that you know guys we did a mistake and we have to find a solution to move forward. And Latla Sibisi, would you say that your country today still fulfills that that potential of exceptionalism, or does Mandela's death in some way signify an end to that notion of South Africa's exceptional role as a beacon? Well, to start with, I would say that Mandela's memory is going to live with us for a very long time, um, um, unless we, uh, we choose to forget. But uh, 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 the lesson that we can still share with uh, the, uh, the other African countries, in one way I can say it was really spread uh, through by Thabo Mbeki uh, uh, with uh, the inclusion of other leaders in Africa, you know, to kind of go through an African renaissance and um, uh, establish institutions, as, I mean, establish uh, institutions within the AU to say that how can we make South Africa better. And I would say, uh, if you notice uh, South Africa's military full, I mean, footprint in, I mean, in Africa, it's actually changed from that what we know what was happening in Angola during the apartheid era to something where we are seeing peacekeeping that's happening in South Sudan. Uh, we see that uh, happening um, um, uh, in the Great Lake region. Uh, DRC and so on. So I would say that we've realized that with whatever strengths that we have, I mean, we can't be living in a sea of prosperity. I mean, you know, being prosperous as South Africa, whereas Africa, which you'd say is the sea, is actually the poverty around us. So it makes a lot of sense that we can still share more, and we are doing that. I want to come back in a bit to the question of leadership in the region and on the continent. But let's stay with the question of leadership at home, perhaps, and take a brief look, first of all, at where South Africa stands today. In 1994, after Nelson Mandela became South Africa's first black president, he used his popularity to call for a better world, a rainbow democracy that embraced everyone, regardless of race or background. Along with his predecessor, he was granted a Nobel Peace Prize for his efforts. South Africa became a beacon of hope on the continent. But after Mandela left office in 1999, the dream began to turn sour. After a promising start in the new millennium, South Africa's society and its economy is now facing serious challenges. The ruling ANC party is torn by internal conflict and increasingly viewed as corrupt. At a huge memorial ceremony for Mandela on Tuesday, current South African President Jacob Zuma was booed by the crowd as he mounted the podium. So has the Rainbow Nation failed to live up to its promise? Or is there still hope for Nelson Mandela's dream? Francisco, um, let's look at a couple of the problems mentioned there in that report and also, of course, by you a bit earlier, uh, starting with massive corruption, also a divided ANC. Mr. Zuma himself faced corruption charges before he became president. Has Mr. Mandela's uh, nearly saintly legacy been tainted by a scramble for self-enrichment among the elite? That is very difficult to assess, actually. In general, um, there have not been major human rights developments uh, during the last years. There have not been very positive developments. There have not been very bad developments. There have been some changes meaning, um, for example, uh, on the legislative level, also some uh, important court rulings, um, and there also have been some uh, negative developments, and also um, the government trying uh, to set down the standard of human rights a little bit. But uh, so far, uh, the courts have been really um, standing against um, those um, tendencies. Um, so, um, this is really difficult to assess. Um, 
Of course, um, there are always rumors um, of corruption uh, within the political entity, but also within the authorities itself. And um, there is a main problem uh, which we see um, as Amnesty International as well. For example, when it comes to the uh, security services or uh, the police officers, um, just to give you an idea, we talk about um, 700 people every year um, which die in a police custody and those people um, are caught, are uh, arrested, um, are uh, detained, um, are tortured, are mistreated and uh, sometimes even, even killed um, when they go to uh, court claiming um, corruption, police corruption, for example. So this is really a, a problem. Then on the other side, um, on the positive side, there is an independent police oversight um, mechanism in South Africa, but they are not able to deal with all of these cases, of course. So there rests a lot of impunity still. So this is just one example. Nanda, and Landa CBC, some critics have said uh, that the new ruling black elite has simply joined the old white uh, ruling class and in fact the vast majority of black South Africans are as badly off as they were under apartheid. Does that go too far or would you agree? I would say to a certain degree it does go too far. Uh, but you see, uh, if we look at South Africa, we have to look at it from the context of when we got our freedom in 1994, the person who took over at that time was the right person at the time to actually bring the nation together. And I mean, he's very, I mean, he was very inspirational and in a lot of, I mean, uh, I mean issues. And uh, I guess after that, he also did realize something that now we need someone who is going to be able to manage government, who is going to be able to uh, uh, to implement the policies uh, th th that have been uh, um, uh, rebuilt. And unfortunately, uh, with the two following leaders, and especially with the latest, uh, I mean, leader, uh, I would say that they've led in certain aspects when it comes to uh, bringing about certain fundamental changes. And I guess some of those changes actually that are required should, I mean, sh should be radical. But uh, the question is that uh, to what degree are they willing to, I mean, to go, I mean, that route. But I would say that the questionability of the current stock of leadership is definitely measured against Mandela. And where is the ANC in all of this? Uh, the, the group, of course, that you joined as such a young man. They used to stand for social justice, even for socialism. Where has all that gone? And I'd like to believe that there are still some within the ANC who stand for that. And unfortunately, uh, we do see this uh, elitism growing uh, um, uh, at a much uh, faster and extraordinary rate than we would want to see. So as a result, it comes back to the point that you were actually raising earlier on that there are instances where you find people becoming extremely rich in the sea of poverty, I mean, around them. And uh, you find that uh, uh, some of them, are, I mean, it's actually questionable as to how quickly they could have accumulated their, I mean, that wealth. And, uh, you know, with the tendering process that's going on in government, there's a lot of cases that have come up, criminal cases and so on. And what is actually uh, very, un, I mean, uh, 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 uncomfortable about the whole, I mean, whole situation is that that money could have gone to social development. And, and that's the reason why we still find some people who are saying that apartheid, we were not as this poor for some people. But also take into consideration from an economic point of view, South Africa's middle black class has grown tremendously. Mr. Um, Hamis, yes. could or should Mandela himself have done more to alter the fundamental economic structures in South Africa? Uh, well, yes and no. Um, the problem is when he took over, um, he was preoccupied in you know uniting the country first of all, preaching the uh, the idea of reconciliation, um, forging one South Africa, forging this rainbow nation. He was preoccupied with that, and to be honest, you know, for the four years was a very short time. Couldn't allow him to carry all you know uh, carry out all his programs. Um, this led to, of course. 
um, for you know the dis disparities between the poor and the rich, which really happened overnight. And unfortunately, Thabo Mbeki couldn't do much on that. And we all know what Zuma is in for. And um, they should have been actually their time to carry on what the big man had as a vision. Francisco, um, you told us, in fact, South Africans definitely do have more rights, at least on paper, human rights. Um, but if the vast majority is facing poverty and violence and crime, don't those greater rights perhaps become somewhat irrelevant? No, they, they haven't, because I just said that um, the courts are still uh, in charge and are very strong and are independent and uh, in general rule in favor of um, those constitutional rights. And um, there also have been some improvements on the legislative um, level done by the um, South African government as well. For example, when it comes to uh, torture prevention, to uh, strengthening um, the police oversight body, but also when it comes to um, attack um, homophobia and violence against uh, homosexuals. Um, so there have been some improvements, but indeed um, we have an, a growing middle class in South Africa. We also have some white people being poor. We also have some uh, black people being rich, but um, there still is a big gap between um, the rich and the poor class in uh, South Africa and of course, unfortunately, um, the um, most of the poor population in South Africa remains black. So there's in, a lot uh, to be done um, in the future. And, um, and let me say this, um, Mandela of course tried to change this a little bit. There was a huge housing program, reconstruction program. Those programs failed also because of um, the missing uh, economic um, funds uh, in South Africa at that time. Um, and also when we asked this question, was Mandela successful? Was there more to be done and so on? We really have to see where um, South Africa was at the time when Mandela took power. So um, there was this apartheid um, system, um, which meant a complete um, system of uh, injustice, oppression and discrimination. South Africa was completely isolated in Africa, in the UN and at this time also um, generally in uh, the international community. And uh, what Mandela did was um, to um, develop the first, the very first progressive constitution in Africa also being a model for other African countries later, uh, incorporating human rights and civil uh, rights, um, creating um, very strong institutions, um, which are still there, um, gladly, and um, also to lead Africa, South Africa back into the international community and even setting um, issues on the agenda such as uh, the fight against HIV and AIDS. So he really did a lot in those uh, couple uh, of years. Uh, yeah. I wonder to what degree, uh, and that Savisi, some of the problems in South Africa today in a way stem from the reverse side of Nelson Mandela's virtues. I'm thinking about issues like the reconciliation process. Did it perhaps overly prioritize tranquility and lose sight of social justice? Also, perhaps his virtue of loyalty, tremendous loyalty to the people around him. Too much so, perhaps? Well, I guess as... Um, um my fellow panelist, uh, I mean panelist, has been saying, you know, uh, some of these um, uh, um, programs that were actually instituted was more about let's try to reconcile and move on, you know, and as a result, uh, uh, at the price of justice, and and like I said earlier on, uh, unfortunately, some people till up till this day, almost 20 years into our freedom now, you still find people who feel and think and. And, and wish that, you know, the justice issue should have been emphasized more. So 
if you look at uh, the way that he handled the situation at that time, I can uh, uh, easily presume that, you know, uh, he was really, really, really not wanting to see any type of revenge. So that could be, you know, if you're in a leadership position, I best, uh, uh, I, w I would like to assume that you can actually uh, try and manage that. But unfortunately, to the person who's been affected uh, by apartheid in one way or another, I mean, depending if, you're, if you're a family member of yours was killed, you, you kind of think differently about it because you're thinking as an individual, you're not thinking in terms of the whole nation. So I guess in his case, it was to actually look at how do we bring this nation together. But, and as we said earlier on, uh, justice was not really um, uh, addressed as we would like to see it. Richard yeah, if I can, you know, uh, join here at this juncture, this one thing that we have to mention that is that um, you see, he brought stability to that country, and when um, the ANC took over, everybody thought that this country is going to split into two, this country is going to go to civil war, which never happened, and we should pay the credit to him, to Nelson Mandela. And um, this coming from someone from Sudan who's yes, on the other side. Yes, <laughs> yes, I know exactly what I'm talking about. And you know, stability is very, very important. And that was the, the number one priority he put. And one should have followed. What should have followed was the economic, you know, prosperity for everybody. Um, you see, in such a situation, the expectations are very, very high. People who have been subjected to racism, to you know, very very bad of kind of uh, discrimination, and when they have their own freedom, they think that things will change overnight, which is not the truth, which is not easy, and um, unfortunately he couldn't do that within that four years, but as I mentioned earlier, you know the following president or government should have done that. But, uh, well, we know that economically it was not feasible. And unfortunately, corruption took the upper hand. And that should be uh, um, what the coming government should be fighting against. Francisco Ulm, you too come from a country that was divided, that faced major upheaval nearly at the same time, just a bit before. Would you say uh, that some of the criticism of South Africa is perhaps unjustified in the sense that it expects too much too quickly. If you look at equality between Western and Eastern Germany, it's still not established long after the wall fell. Uh, I think you can't compare um, the system of um, the former Democratic Republic, um, the GDR, um, and the apartheid system in South Africa. No, some, simply in the sense of time and how much time it takes to, to also, really achieve fundamental change. Also as well, because um, we are coming from different economic levels and uh, points. So um, you have South Africa divided uh, into, I just briefly uh, described, um, divided into the black population and the white population during the apartheid. So the white population getting all the higher um, yeah, jobs and quality. They were mm. affluent, they were rich, yeah. they had everything almost. Yeah, mm. exactly. And uh, then the black population not being allowed uh, to take all uh, their jobs they wanted to. So that's a completely different situation uh, than in uh, Eastern Germany. So I don't know how to compare the situation actually. My point was simply about time and how long it can take uh, for fundamental change to yeah. occur. Let us come back perhaps to the question of South Africa's role in Africa as a whole. Um, Again, that idea of South African exceptionalism led to hopes that it would become a beacon for the continent. Do you feel that South Africa has fulfilled its leadership role or is continuing to do so in 2013 in Landa CBC? I guess, you know, it's not an individual role of just one country. 
because uh, we also have a lot to, uh, to learn from the African continent when it comes to different kind of issues. Uh, and I, I still think uh, as much as at times South Africa is like expected to be continuously taking the lead, uh, you need to remember that other African countries also have their uh, independent way of, I mean, of looking at issues. So at some point I, uh, I can say that South Africa has also avoided uh, the situation where we look as the colonizers within or the recolonizing uh, within the African country, I mean, I mean continent, by a so-called rich country, which is South Africa right now. So I would say that government is stepping cautiously when it deals with other African countries. But from the different examples that I gave you earlier on, we still see some form of leadership taking shape uh, by South Africa. And uh, it's in different ways. Like if we go to the DRC again, it's not only about military, but it's also about re-establishing uh, government institutions. We have a uh, a uh, training partnership between South Africa and the DRC where uh, government officials from the DRC are trained in South Africa in, w in one of the institutions that we have there on, on finance issues, managerial issues, uh, economic issues and things like that. So I would actually like to see a South Africa which is working in partnership uh, with other African countries because other African countries also have some form of leadership that they can, I mean, that they can offer. and. Um, in some instances, we do set the example. You mentioned uh, an idea of South Africa as an almost neo-colonial power within Africa. I, in fact, have read criticism that South Africans don't think of themselves as Africans, that they don't have an identity uh, with the continent as a whole. Do you think that's true? Do you know, it would be true to, I mean, to a degree, if you listen, like, for instance, to some academics, when they say South Africa and the rest of Africa, as if South Africa is like cut off from, uh, I mean, from, <laughs> from Africa, which is true to a certain degree. But also, uh, I'd, I'd also like to just say that, you know, uh, 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 we've also had our own sort of misunderstanding where a lot of South African companies are doing business in different African countries. And uh, uh, some of those uh, companies have been accused of actually imposing their own will within that given country. And we've, we've received some criticism, uh, I mean, when it comes to that part. And I'm hoping that we're actually learning from that. Mr. Khamis, how would people in South Sudan, in the northern parts of Africa, see South Africa? Would they say um, the same kind of things, that perhaps there's a neo-colonial aspect towards South Africa's relation with the rest of the continent? No, 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 not at all, not at all. Uh, <laughs> they would really admire South Africa for the, um, not only the economic achievement, but also for the political achievement. And this is, as I mentioned earlier, is also credited to Nelson Mandela. Um, actually, they're doing it. They are, they are, they're learning from South Africa. Um, they're, they're, they even created reconciliation commissions in the north and in the south, just as the model in South Africa. And uh, um, they, they look at that part of the country, uh, that part of the, the continent as a, a big brother who knows more in a certain area and we can learn from them. And uh, the idea of neocolonialism is not really <laughs> and what uh, Sudanese have in mind when they look at South Africa. Would you say that the Big Brother has done enough, for example, um, to rein in Mr. Mugabe? Could South Africa have done more there to exercise leadership? Well, personally, I would say yes. South Africa should have done more because um, when you look at the history, um, when the whites had to relinquish you know, political power in South Africa, um, they left something behind. They left infrastructures behind. They left um, functioning um, structures of government behind. And when you compare to what happened to Zimbabwe after Rhodesia has gone, everything has been, almost everything has been destroyed. And um, then you ask yourself, why? Why did that happen? Why? Um, didn't Zimbabwe, for example, look up at South Africa, even by then, 
to see what Nelson Mandela is doing, you know, negotiating with the whites, and, um, but keeping the structure that one inherited, you know, the way it is, even if the black you know, government is ruling the country, but why do you destroy the infrastructure? Francisco, um, do you think realistically South Africa could have played a greater role in helping Zimbabwe uh, to uh, overcome Mugabe and his legacy? Yeah, that's a very difficult, a very difficult question uh, because um, Mandela, when uh, during his presidency, also um, advised Mugabe to step down from power, which we know he didn't do, <laughs> of course. And uh, later, I think in 2008, uh, he also said that uh, Mugabe's government is, co is a complete failure of uh, Zimbabwean policy. So, um, South Africa tries to influence um, Zimbabwe, and that's also what we have been seeing um, before uh, the last elections. And um, it's also true that if you want to um, yeah, influence Zimbabwe, you have to go through South Africa. There is no other way around. You cannot address uh, Mugabe um, himself, wouldn't make any sense. And um, we have to bear in mind that uh, it's also South Africa that um, leads the African Union right now. So, so uh, at the moment, South Africa is politically seen even more powerful in uh, Africa. Um, but of course, we would wish clearer words um, sometimes from Mr. Zuma towards um, Mr. Mugabe. Um, but uh, there also have been some discussions between both, between both of them, uh, which also were uh, publicly and Mugabe denouncing uh, any influence of uh, South Africa. So that's very difficult there to find um, a way to really get through. And Lana Sibisi, um, what would you want to see from your country going forward in terms of continental and regional a role? Well, uh, coming back to the issue of Zimbabwe as an example, uh, uh, all three presidents that we've had um, have engaged uh, with uh, Zimbabwe in, uh, I mean, at, at different levels, in, in definitely a different way. And I must say one thing, that South Africa respects Zimbabwe as a sovereign country. So some people would wish that Mugabe would just be wished away and he can go uh, due to uh, the economic management of, of, of the country. But at the same time, you need to understand that the, I mean, uh, 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 the African leaders sort of have a certain understanding about each other. And that understanding, is sometimes it has its roots in uh, the struggle against colonialism and I mean, in apartheid. So when you look at these issues, uh, you actually can't just look at them in isolation. You need to understand the, I mean, the intricacies involved in the type of relationships. I mean, at face value, it looks like South Africa is not really doing anything. But if you've followed the different engagements, you'll notice that through SADC, through the AU, it's all, all, all the serving presidents of South Africa have engaged. And I'm sure there has been uh, behind the scene talks where uh, 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 South Africa has offered some form of advice as to how um, uh, the country should be managed. As for the rest of Africa, I guess, as I said earlier on, we're still continuing engaging in different ways. We're helping different countries in different ways. And uh, 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 that role needs to be, I mean, to be stepped up. And I guess we have some influence in terms of, you know, countries that are still resisting your, uh, the implementation of democracy, we, um, I guess we still have that influence of, of actually pushing those countries to go in that direction. Please, maybe one example. Um, in the upcoming elections, uh, Zimbabwe denied international election observers. So it was only um, through negotiations with South Africa that they um, accepted election observers through SADC and the African Union. So this was the only way. So this would be a, a concrete example then. Yeah. We are coming close to the end of our program, but I want to briefly ask all of you about leadership, because leadership, of course, is a major 
topic in Africa in general. Questions of improving governance so often come down to good leadership. I think um, we're all in agreement that Nelson Mandela was a very exceptional leader. Barack Obama referred to him as uh, one in a century. What do you think, Richard Hamis, when you had to, if you had to name three qualities of leadership that Nelson Mandela had that could be important for Africa, for us all looking forward, what would they be? Uh, well, I could say one thing is, you know, he had a vision, mm -hmm. a very positive vision. He knew exactly where uh, the country was going to or where the continent was going to. And um, he believed in humanity. We're all human beings, we have to respect each other and we have to live together whether we like it or not. But there should be some mechanism, you know, uh, defining how we live together. And then of course, the, um, the issue of democracy. This is a person who was elected as a president, he stayed in office for four years and he said, guys, I've done my part, take over. It's admirable. And Lana Sivisi? I would say the man, you know, you can learn a, a lot of humility from him. Uh, he's been humble, extremely humble to, uh, to, to the point where people are still really amazed by that. Uh, and I guess he had a lot of respect for people around him. And uh, uh, he continued that till, I mean, till this day. And I, I, I would say that, you know, uh, in the case of South Africa, sometimes uh, we will make uh, uh, judgments on the current leaders. But we also need to remember that within the times, like when Mandela served, what uh, uh, main, uh, as Francisca said, what main changes that he brought about. When the next president followed, I mean, he, he also had his own achievements. Likewise, the current president today, he did a lot on, I mean, on AIDS. And that, I mean, that was an achievement for him. So, yeah, I guess there's a lot of these guys. I want to give Francisca a chance. Three, three qualities, three and words. Three qualities. I just add learning, maybe, that he was very capable of learning during uh, all the apartheid system and after being released and adjusting to the situation. Thank you very, very much to all of you for being with us on the program today. And thanks to all of you out there for tuning in. See you soon. <laughs>